Welcome to the Mountain Springs Fellowship Bible Church. Jesus gave us the ultimate sacrifice, allowing himself to be scourged and hung on a cross, enduring humiliation and death. He took our sin so that we may have eternal life. Today, Pastor James Reed talks about honoring his journey with the way we walk in ours. Are we a living example worthy of his sacrifice? Are you carrying the cross in your journey? Join us now from the little church on the curve. The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and raised up on the third day. That's such an important verse for us to, to, to just kind of look at for a second and realize that Jesus knew exactly what was about to happen. He knew that he was going to get scourged. He knew that. He knew that he was going to get arrested and scourged and, and beaten and crucified. He knows this is going to happen. There's no doubt in his mind. I always want to reiterate this because I've heard so many different, what I feel are false teachings on this, but Jesus his prayer, his high priestly prayer, his prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane, he did not want to be separated from the Father. He had to take sin on, therefore he couldn't be in the presence of the Father. He had to take the sins of the world on, and he didn't want that. He said, Father, take this cup and we let it pass, but not my will, the church. In other words, I'm fixing to have to go through something that's going to separate me from you, and I'm going to need a lot of strength and a lot of power to do this as a man. I'm going to need, I'm going to need you, and I'm not going to have you. And, and it's that separation. We don't think about that often. We don't realize when I feel the struggles of life coming on, I always have to check. God, where, where am I? Where, am I in your presence? Is my heart turned towards you? The eyes of the Lord move to and fro throughout the earth so that he would strongly support those whose hearts are turned towards him. Remember we just last week went over the scourging. The brutal, evil, excruciating scourging where they mocked him, they spat on him, hit him on the head with the crown of thorns that were on his head, hitting it with a stick and, and just, just really beating him to, to, to no end. I mean, it, I can't even imagine. He, he did this willingly. He went there willingly. All this he did willingly. He, he offered no resistance on his arrest. He offered no resistance to the false claims against him. He offered no resistance to anything. He only claimed throughout this process that I am the Son of God. That I am the Son of God, the Son of Man, the Great I Am. I am He. And so this passion that Jesus is, is giving in throughout this whole process, that what He's doing, is for our salvation. You know, he, he wore the crown of thorns so that we can wear the helmet of salvation. Amen? I mean, that, think about that's what we were given. That we now have peace of mind that He took all that thorn and thistle, the things that we struggle with in everyday life, he took that to the cross so that we don't have to struggle with that because we have this helmet of salvation. And so we always have to remember that, how important that is. And in verse 8, John 19, in verse 8, it says, Therefore, when Pilate heard this statement, he was even more afraid. And the statement that he heard is that the Jews said he's claiming to be the Son of God. And he entered into the praetorium again and said to Jesus, where are you from? And Jesus gave him no answer. So Pilate said to him, You do not speak to me? Do you not know that I have the authority to release you? I have the authority to crucify you? I mean, Pilate is saying, I, I am the man that can free you. I'm the man that can set you free. Talk to me. Give me reason. Give me cause. Let me help you get free here because... Pilate, remember, sees no guilt in him, and he just scourged an innocent man. A man he knew who was innocent, he just had him scourged. And there's Jesus standing there in this, this purple robe, this crimson robe, wool robe with the, the dry blood and, and, and all that digging into him and the crown of thorns and, and his flesh torn open and all this, this stuff that had happened to him. And he, there's this Jesus in, in this weakened state from all the blood loss and he's, he's saying, I, I want to help you. Jesus said something really interesting here. He said, you, you have no authority over me. You have no authority over me unless it had been given to you from above. That Pontius Pilate's authority, though given to him by Caesar, really was his authority given to him from above. That God is sovereign. <laughs> God 
knows what's going on. God has this perfect plan in place that's moving just as God planned all through motion. And that Jesus is saying, your authority, look, you can look to Caesar for your authority, but your authority was given from above. He's looking at it, he says, for this reason, he who delivered me to you has the greater sin. And Jesus came for the very purpose of, re of man returning back to God. Here we have this Jewish, these religions that man had put on man in the name of God. And here's Jesus saying, no, that's not who, I, that's not who God is. You can't burden a man to death. You can't burden a man in God for your own gain. You can't burden a man in God for anybody's gain. God didn't come. God's people, chosen people, aren't mere puppets to do things that you think, that you say need to be done so that they can receive God. No, just the opposite. God has always called on man to have that personal relationship. Adam, where are you? I was hiding from you in the garden because I was afraid. There was a separation at that moment from Adam to God. That Adam separated himself from God because of his sin, because he was afraid, because he had done the very thing God had told him not to do. The one commandment God gave him, he went against that commandment and separated himself from God. God didn't separate Adam from him. Adam separated himself from God. And this is what Jesus has come to undone. There's such a pile of... Um, religious things that these people are having to do just to say I'm a Jew, just to say that I'm a chosen child of God. There's so many things they had to do. You know, they're now buying their way through the, through the process. They're now giving money over so that they uh, a sacrifice. They're giving money over to pay their way through access to God. And God, that this is, God has never wanted that. God never wanted us to have to pay for any access to that's not the purpose of God. God's not a business. But religion has made God a business. The sin isn't what you're doing to me. The sin is that the religion has handed God over to society. You see that? That's what Jesus is saying here. In verse 13, Then therefore, when Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus up, and he sat down on his judgment seat. Here's Pontius Pilate, and he brings out his, his judgment seat. Famous, whatever you want to call it, but it's 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 the seat that kings judge people to life or death on. And he's going to condemn Jesus. He's going to condemn this man that who's claimed to be the Son of God, who said you have no authority unless God has given you that authority. That listen, you do what you must do because it's not your sin; it's the sin of those who delivered me to you. That he tells. Uh, Pontius Pilate, that all who hear the truth, all who know me hear the truth. And Pontius Pilate says, well, what is the truth? I mean, we go through this and look at what Pontius Pilate's, his only exposure to Jesus is the religion wanting to, to kill him. Is the religious leaders so angry that he violated the Sabbath and he claims to be the Son of God, that he's blasphemed, that he's told people that God is not a business, but that he's a place of worship, a house of worship. Don't make my father out to be something he's not. You have taken God and you've pulled him down so that you think man can manage him. You've taken God to a place where you think you, you know who God is and you have no clue because if you knew God, you would know I'm his son. Period. And then in verse 14, it says, Now it was the day of preparation for the Passover. They have to make sure that there's none, no leaven. There's nothing unclean. Leaven was a sign that you didn't be puffed up. You weren't arrogant. That, you, that they ate unleavened bread because that was what they had in, during the Exodus, during the Passover, because they didn't have time to put the, the bread to leaven, to rise up. And so this symbol of leavened bread, this symbol of this Passover, this symbol of this preparation of this Passover. These, these religious leaders, here's how they're preparing their day for Passover. We're going to kill this man, this innocent man, this man who's done no harm, done no wrong. We're going to kill him. They're acting deceitful, they're acting in anger, and they're acting in rage. They want blood. They want this man dead. On the day of preparation for Passover, it was about the sixth over, 
And Pontius Pilate said to the Jews, Behold, your king, with a capital K, your king. So they cried out, Away with him! Away with him! Crucify him! Pilate said, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priest answered, We have no king but Caesar. What they just did. Hear what the Jewish people just did, what the Jewish leadership just did. They have completely rejected God. They have completely taken God and tossed him aside. Out of hate, out of anger, out of rage, just out of jealousy. They have completely taken God out and they claimed society, Caesar, as their king. That, that's, that's huge because that, that's going on today. That hasn't changed. They still don't worship Jesus. You have to be a Messianic Jew, a completed Jew, who now has accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Verse 16, So he then handed him over to them to be crucified. Pontius Pilate has the authority, the power, the manpower to quiet this revolt. He has the ability to silence these people. He has the ability to harbor Jesus. The crowd saying, if you don't crucify him, you're no friend of Caesar's. The religion was going to the society to kill their Messiah, their Son of God. Society was, okay, just do with him whatever you want to do. So we have this great tension going on between society and religion. Needing to come together to crucify God. Verse 17. So they took Jesus, and he went out bearing his own cross. A lot of people have a struggle with that, that verse, bearing his own cross. They say, well, the, other, the synoptic gospels, the other three gospels say he didn't bear his own cross. He didn't, he didn't do that. John, in his gospel, is writing about who God is. Remember what verse, uh, chapter 20, verse 30 says that he wrote these things down so that you may believe as Jesus as your Lord and Savior, that he's the Son of God, that you may believe who he is. So John, when he's writing down his message to these things, what he's telling you is exactly what happened. They took Jesus, therefore, and he went out bearing his own cross, that he left the praetorium, the, the temple walls, the, the walls of Jerusalem, bearing his own cross. Look at Matthew 27, verse 32. It says, As they were coming out, they found a man of Cyrene named Simon, whom they pressed into service to bear his cross. That as Jesus was coming out, out of the city, here's this man Simon from Cyrene coming into the city. Now why was Simon coming into the city? He was coming in because he was a Jewish man and was coming to the temple to, for the Passover feast. He was coming for his religious duty. He was coming from Cyrene. He was coming from a ways off. Cyrene is, up, is about where Libya is in Africa. So he's coming this, this long ways off. So his journey started many, many days before to go to the Passover. And so he's coming into the city to do his religious duty. More ahead from Pastor James in a moment. But first, we're honored that you've joined us this morning. If you would like to visit us in person, Sunday service begins at 10.30 a.m. For more information, visit us at msfbc.net. The Mountain Springs Fellowship Bible Church is a fellowship of believers who are caring and committed through our walk with Christ. Our purpose is to share Jesus Christ and Him crucified, to be a uniting light in the pasture God gave us purpose over, and cultivate hope and joy and faith through the love of God and the Spirit in us. When you accept Jesus into your life, God pours His righteousness into you. And now, back to the message. Now, why was Simon coming into the city? He was coming in because he was a Jewish man coming for his religious duty. He was coming from Cyrene. So his journey started many, many days before to go to the Passover. God is sovereign. God knows exactly what he's doing. We have a Bible written for a purpose. Now, 
that's a pretty obscure verse when you really think about it, Matthew. Why they why they press this guy named Siren and uh, named this, this Cyrene named Simon uh, to bear the cross? And, and they said he had they pressed him. In other words, he wasn't willing. No, I don't want to carry his cross. I'm unwilling. I don't want to do this. I am not going to do what you've asked me to do. Now they pressed him. That means they forced him to carry the cross. Look at Mark 15. I heard once that if if, if the scripture has a name in it. There's a good reason for it. So why is the name Simon in our scripture? Mark 15, verse 21 says, They pressed into service a passerby coming from the country, Simon of Cyrene, whoa, the father of Alexander and Rufus, to bear his cross. Now why would Mark add, add that the father of, of, of Alexander and Rufus? Because Mark knew, the, knew Simon. Well, how did Mark know Simon? Simon was coming in from Cyrene that day to do his religious deeds, to do his religious duty. And they're making him carry the cross. They're making him carry the cross from outside the city gates to the, up, up the hill of, to, of Golgotha. Well, how does, how does Mark know him? And how does Mark's readers know that he helped him carry the cross? Well, let's look at Acts 11. <laughs> I'm having fun with this. This was fun. Acts 11, 19. Well, let me set this up. So what's happened at this time is the church has begun to grow and it's called out seven men, one of them being Stephen, who was a holy and righteous man, who was a good man. Who they called them into service to help preach to the people. Now Stephen gets stoned by, not stoned, stoned, thrown rocks at. He gets stoned by the Jewish people. But who's there? Who's there when that happens? Saul of Tarsus. Saul of Tarsus is over there encouraging them to stone Stephen. Interesting, right? Well, what happens after they get stoned, is, after Stephen gets stoned to death, is now the church who's huddled up, listen to this, who's huddled up in this one little area of Jerusalem, whose great commission was to what? To go make disciples of all nations, you know, uh, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and all about all uttermost parts of the region. They never to spread out. And it hasn't happened yet. They're all there. Well, watch this. So then those who were scattered because of the persecution that occurred in connection with Stephen made their way to Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch speaking the words to no one except the Jews alone. Except the Jews alone. The Jewish, the Jewish people, the, the uh, disciples of Christ, are only going to speak to other Jewish people. Well, no, it's for all nations. It's for Jew and Gentile. It's for everybody. Watch this. But there were some of them, men of Cyprus and Cyrene, who came to Antioch and began speaking to the Greeks also, preaching the Lord Jesus. Cyprus, that's Barnabas. Barnabas came over from Cyprus and was teaching in Antioch. The Cyrene here is Simon, the one who carried the cross of Christ. The one who bore the cross of Christ is now scattered up to Antioch. How do we know that? Look at chapter 13, verse 1. Now the word Antioch, in the church that were, was there, prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was also called Niger, and Lucius of Cyrene. They, that's who they're talking about. That this Simon was a black man who came over from Cyrene to go to the Passover that day because he was doing his religious duty, and as he's walking into the city, a guard presses him into service and says, no, you help him carry that cross because Jesus has lost all this blood. He's not a, he is weak, and it's taking too long to crucify him. So let's get some strong young buck to carry that cross. So they get Simon. What's going on in Antioch? Gentiles are being converted. Gentiles are becoming Christians. How do we know that? Verse 23. Then when he arrived and, and witnessed the grace of God that he's talking about Barnabas arrived, he rejoiced and began encouraging them all with resolute heart to remain true to the Lord. For he was a good man and full of the Holy Spirit of faith. And considerable numbers, considerable numbers were brought to the Lord. And then Barnabas left to go to where? To go to Tarsus. To get Saul. 
Saul hadn't even begun his ministry yet. But God set Saul aside to teach to the Gentiles. And when he brought, found them and brought them to Antioch, and, and for an entire year they met with the church and taught considerable numbers, and the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. See that? You see how important Simon was? God didn't just use him, but that was an oh, by the way. This was an important event that just occurred. Simon was called at this time because God knows what's going to happen. Go, go to uh, Luke 23. Luke picks up this story about Simon in verse 26. In Luke, he says they seized a man, Simon of Cyrene, coming in from the country and placed him on the cross to carry, whoop, behind Jesus. See that? He carried the, he followed Jesus carrying his cross. You see the importance of that verse? That he picked up the cross and followed Christ with it. That he followed Jesus up to uh, Golgotha, up to be crucified. Now, can you imagine? I mean, here you are, face to face with the scourge beaten Savior of the world, with the Christ, the, the, the Son of God, the Son of Man, the Great I Am. There you are, eye to eye contact with this man who's going to his death. And he's not, listen, he's not going there fighting it. He's not going there not willingly. He's not going there saying, I don't want to go, I don't want to go. Father, could he take this cup from me and let it pass? No, he's forging on. Let's do this. This is what my dad came here for. I'm coming to die. I'm coming here to be the savior of the world. This is my mission. This is my purpose. This is what I've come for, to bring this up to Golgotha. And they press Simon into helping him with that cross up there. What does Jesus do? And following him, Jesus was a large crowd of people and of women who were mourning and lamenting him. But Jesus, turning to them, said, Daughters of Jerusalem, stop weeping for me, but weep for yourselves. <laughs> Jesus is not concerned about him. He's not concerned about him. You know what he's concerned about? He's concerned about their salvation. He's concerned about what their hopes are. He's concerned about what's going to happen with them. He's telling these people, listen, don't weep for me. Weep for yourselves. Hope that you can understand what's going on. Hope that you can understand what's happening here. And Simon has listened to this. Simon's carrying this cross, listening to this message that Jesus has given the people who are either mocking him or mourning him, who are there to watch the crucifixion or there to cry about the crucifixion. But all these people are going to this public crucifixion with Jesus being crucified, who they just hailed, listen, who they just hailed a week before, Palm Sunday, hey, hail to the king, here comes the king, the Messiah is coming in, riding on a foal, here's this king, this new king we have, and they're all hailing him, now they're walking out of that city, towards the hill of Golgotha, mourning, some mourning, some mocking, some, we have such a, a, a contrast of what's going on, but here's Jesus praying for his people, praying for the people that are falling behind him and mourning him. And here's Simon carrying his cross going, this man's fixing to die. Who is this man? I have no idea who this man is. Here I was minding my own business, just coming to the city. I wasn't bothering nobody. And it made me carry this cross with this dude I don't even know. I'll tell you, by the time he got to the top, by the time he saw the Lord crucified, laying down, went by himself to lay down on that cross and get his hands nailed, his feet nailed, stripped, and put on that cross and hung, Simon saw that. And you don't think Simon didn't hang around to find out who Jesus is? Why did he get, why were they doing that to him? Why did he claim to be the Son of God? Why, why, why? Wouldn't you be asking those questions? Wouldn't you want to know why did I just have to help this guy? who was bloodied and bludgeoned and beaten and his skin torn off him, wearing a crown of thorns, who just, who was, they were just, made him out to be a mess. Why did I have to carry this man's cross? What, what possibly could he have done? He claimed to be the Son of God. Simon was pressed into service by God that day. Simon, I don't know this, but I will tell you, I, I, I gather from the scriptures that Simon was probably one of the 120 people that were in the upper room on Pentecost. 
that Simon was stayed with the disciples to learn who Jesus was. That Simon knew, hey, listen, this man was covered in the blood of Jesus carrying that cross. Amen? He was covered in the blood of Jesus carrying that cross up to the hill. And God had such an impact on his life. Jesus' impact on Simon's life was huge because Simon no longer went to the religion and followed his religious duties and do the things of the religion and just blah, 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 blah. No, Simon, he became a spokesman because he carried the burden. He knew what it was like to carry that burden. He knew what it was like. He knew what it looked like to be scourged. He understood how it was for Jesus to die because he walked with him through that trial. And he, he, he followed him through that trial. And he watched him get nailed to, to, a, to a cross, saying, forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. It wasn't past tense. It was present tense. He was telling the Father to forgive the soldiers that were nailing to the cross. Forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. And Simon's going, this is crazy. Why would, why would some man do that? Who is this man who loves to, who forgives his very persecutors, who forgives just because he loves. Who is this man? And that same man is now standing in Antioch, converting people to Christianity, converting people from paganism or Judaism to Christianity. If you think that his conversion is... His message wasn't about the cross. His message was all about the cross. Paul said, I'm determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. That we're here to preach a message about the cross, the cross of Christ, that beautiful instrument of death that we look upon for, for love, for grace, for mercy, for salvation. That instrument of death that we hold so dear because we understand why Jesus was crucified. We understand why he had to do the things he had to do. We understand everything about the cross because that's what we preach. That there's nothing that you're going through in your life today. Nothing that you're going through in your life today that you can't bring to the cross you can't lay your burdens on the, on the yoke of Christ. Think about that. There's nothing going on in this world today that Jesus can't heal. What a glorious Savior. What a glorious godly servant. I'm amazed when, I, when you see little, little things in the Bible that you just go, hey, Simon of Cyrene. Why do they say that? Why do they say that thing like everybody knew? I mean, Paul says that in his closing of Romans 16, he gives greetings to Rufus and Rufus' mother, whom he calls mother. That's how well Paul knew Rufus, the son of Simon. And Alexander. But he's up there in Ephesus standing boldly for the Lord. And we have Simon, dead in Antioch. Preaching about Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Amen. The glorious God we serve. You got to take up your cross daily. Daily. And follow Christ. It's not a one time event, it's a daily event. It's an all day event. What does that look like? Choose love. Choose love. Choose love over religion. Choose love over society choose love though you might get crucified for it this service is brought to you by the Mountain Springs Fellowship Bible Church if you would like a copy of today's message or would like to discover more messages from Pastor James please visit us at www.msfbc.net Blessings and may the peace of Christ be with you.